Podcastle. Number four. For April twenty second, two thousand eight. Goose Girl, by Margaret Ronald. Hi there. This is Rachel Sworsky, Podcastle's chief editor. We've had a call on our message boards for more personal content from our hosts. I probably won't talk as much about myself as Steve does, but I'm happy to run down my vitals. I'm 26 years old. I'm going to graduate school in Iowa. I'm getting married in June to my boyfriend of five years. And at the risk of being nauseating, I'll say that I find myself thinking at least daily how grateful I am to be with him. My mother has a tendency to communicate by giving me books so she can show me how she felt while she was reading. I hope to communicate with you all in a similar way about this story. Margaret Ronald's Goose Girl is a retelling of the classic fairy tale by the same name, but it's not just any fairy tale. This piece questions the nature of identity and memory by breaking them down. These issues are especially apt in my recent life. Over Christmas, I learned that a friend of mine I'd lost touch with had a breakdown a couple years ago. Many of his memories from time periods throughout his life simply vanished. He doesn't remember sitting up playing card games in my dorm room or driving up to Seattle to visit me when I went to a writing workshop or our long conversations when we walked through the redwoods. He only knows my name because it's written in his diary. My friend is 28 years old. Unlike Alzheimer's patients, he forms new memories perfectly well. The friend I had is both there and gone. Much of his personality seems in essence the same, but how much was constructed from his memories? What of him is irretrievably lost? From time to time, I find myself remembering something we shared and feeling an intense, odd grief. Margaret Ronald's piece examines these issues from an insider's perspective. Her fiction has appeared in Strange Horizons, Realms of Fantasy, Fantasy Magazine, and Helix. Her first novel, Spiral Hunt, will be coming out from Eos Books in April 2009. Goose Girl first appeared in the Fantasy Magazine Sampler, which was published by Prime Books in 2007. It's read by Mary Robinette Kowal, professional puppeteer and one of this podcast's hosts. Mary Robinette is one of this year's nominees for the John W. Campbell Award, which is given annually to an outstanding new science fiction or fantasy writer. On behalf of Podcastle, I wish Mary Robinette the best of luck. There's also been a call on our message boards for a tagline like the ones on Escape Pod and Pseudopod. Well, if one's going to come along, I think it needs to happen naturally. For now, you'll have to settle for enjoy the story. Goose Girl by Margaret Ronald. I stumble into the city at the back of the princess's entourage, clutching the red book to my chest. By the time someone notices me, I can almost speak again. You came with the princess Alia, didn't you? Says a tall man with an under-steward's chain. They must have low standards up north if you're the sort of thing she brings along. I shake my head. The world slides in and out of focus. I didn't come here for that. I'm not... Help. He raises his eyebrows. Oh, so you're not with the help? You must be one of the nobility, then. He tweaks my skirts, and a ragged hem tears. So, what did you come here for if you're not with the princess? The words sound wrong, even as I think them. But I say them nonetheless. To be married. He bursts out laughing. Poor girl, a woman at the back of the servants' hall says. She's simple. Can't tell between herself and the princess. No, I say, or try to say. But the words have come apart again, and it comes out in a rush of court poetry and gutter talk, unintelligible to noble and peasant alike. The tall man laughs again and reaches for the red book. I skitter away, and a stink of pigs fills my nose. 
Leave her be, Conrad. A man says behind me. His voice is deep and should not be familiar. Conrad makes a face, whether from being thwarted or the smell, I cannot tell. I'll put her with the geese, he says, turning away. They're about as dumb as she is, just like you and your pigs. Just so, the swineherd says, and leans down to help me up. Are you all right? Yes, your majesty, I say, and cover my mouth. He blinks, then laughs a second too late, and helps me to my feet. I stare after him. I have never seen this man before, never seen his curls streaked with gray, nor the somber dark eyes. But I remember him, remember a portrait presented to me of the family of my betrothed. But I have no betrothed. I am a hag, a witch woman, and now a goose girl. At supper that night, I hear how the king could not attend the ceremonies greeting his new daughter-in-law. He is ill much of the time now, says one of the under stewards. Not Conrad. Conrad is elsewhere. So much so that the council meetings go on without him, with the prince in his place. Good that the prince is marrying, then, says another. She's older than he. She'll teach him constancy. That'll take a miracle, another says, and laughs, though it is not nice laughter. I peer down the table for the swineherd, but do not see him. I look at my plate, and my head swims. Somewhere the food is swan's wing and plums, but here it is bread and dripping, and when I reach for it I miss knocking it onto my dress. Someone sighs, and I cover my face. I came here to be married, I say to my palms, and cannot stop shaking. There is work to do, and it cannot stop for one confused woman. Its rhythm aids me as the thumping beat of music aids a faltering dancer. I ignore the marriage preparations, ignore the handsome prince and the beautiful princess and Conrad, and take the geese down to the river each day. There I read the red book, learning it as I did before, once, maybe. It is not in a script I know, and that I could read other scripts surprises me, for am I not a goose girl only? But nonetheless, I can read it. And this tells me one other thing. Only a witch could read these blotted brown words. So I know what I must be. The Red Book's words are mutable. One, to deter, can mean to prevent sickness entering into a wound. To keep midges from clustering around one's face. Or to distract Conrad so he will stop tweaking my skirts. Or there is to poison, which can mean to wilt the weeds in a field while leaving the barley untouched. To sour a cask of beer with a glance. Or to turn a person's heart against a loved one. I study the words day by day at the river and ignore the meaningless courtier's chatter of geese. The Red Book is powerful. I remember my crabbed and wizened mother, the witch, warning me of it on her deathbed. She pressed the stained linen pages into my hands and cautioned me to use it well, for I had a wild look, and she feared what I might do. But this I also remember. My stately and sorrowful mother, the queen, pricking her finger and letting three drops fall upon a swan-white handkerchief. She pressed the blotted linen into my hands and cautioned me never to lose it, for I had a long journey to make, and she feared for my safety. And I cannot remember which mother is mine, nor which I love. I pressed the heels of my hands to my eyes. Did I leave my mother's home in a great procession, off to the castle of my betrothed, there to make a new life? Or 
Did I leave my mother's home in dead of night, following the lights of a far caravan, determined to use the book to write myself a new life? The procession itself is a snarl of images, inextricable. I remember a new maidservant, a foreign princess, a fallen handkerchief, and a chalice spilling water. Remember words spoken and heard, but which words? There is another word in the Red Book, to cleave, which means to make one where there were two, or two where there was one. I do not understand this word. For some time, I cannot believe that no one else has guessed the swineherd's secret. How he works only when the king is sick. How he contrives to be away should the prince come calling among the maidservants. How the lines of his profile are reflected on the coin of the realm. But when they speak of the king, they always call him old. And in time, I see that this is his greatest disguise. Not a smock and artfully applied dirt but his relative youth. He is no more than twelve years older than I. He fathered the prince young and was widowed young. And I, no matter which memory I touch, know I was old to be married, past twenty at least. Maybe they confuse the king with his father, who died only a year ago, and whose endless senescence has endowed the crown with years. Maybe the vitality of the prince steals in a youth from his surroundings. Maybe it is only that no one cares to look too closely at one who reeks of pigs. He finds me practicing my witchery down by the river, shaping a stone and causing grass figures to dance. And though it is enough to have me cast out of the palace, he does not denounce me. Instead, he is fascinated and tells me of times he met witches on his wanderings and laughs for sheer joy when I spin last year's leaves into a whirlwind. No one has ever admired me for what I can do, only for what I was. I think of the heavy weight of brocade and shake my sleeves back to give my hands more freedom. On the days that I take the geese down to the river, he joins me, and we sit together on the mud-slick banks. When the world shivers around me, he tells me stories till the fit passes, stories of going forth to seek his fortune, of ogres and conjurers, and treasure hidden beneath wandering stones. I smile, and do not tell him that a swineherd is unlikely to have had such adventures. There is always a spot that he forgets to dirty, just past where his graying curls end. On the prince, this spot is always covered by high collars and rich cloaks. His father, the king, tugs the neck of his shirt open and gazes at the sky and has not found the fortune he sought. The north gate of the palace is the grandest, and it is through there that most of the traffic passes. Three days before the wedding, I drive my charges through it for the first time and hear a grinding moan as though the wall itself were crying out. I am not far wrong. A small shrine of Epona, the horse goddess, is cut into the gate to bless all who travel through, and it is this that has spoken. A horse's head, carved in weathered stone, struggles to speak around its bit and bridle. Child, if your mother knew, it groans. Her royal heart would break in two. I stop dead, the geese milling about me like baffled children. To either side, the traffic continues unabated. No one else has heard the horses cry. Epona? I say. But it does not speak again. And it does not need to. I remember now why it might speak to me, for I was named for the horse goddess. But was it a queen or a witch who named me so? My heart is not so delicate as a queen's, I think, because I am not royal. Or perhaps it is that I am already broken. The king in a swineherd's smock has escaped his court for the day, and thus 
I have company on the river bank. I know enough not to call him Majesty now, and he is good enough not to recall my one error. He carries water in his hat as we coax our charges back to the castle, and I laugh at him. He laughs too, and for a moment there is no chasm in my mind, or none that matters. We reach the gate, but the prince and princess are there before us, returning from the hunt. The prince on his charger hurtles past, heedless and beautiful. Briefly I catch a wistful look on the king's face. The princess rides behind, regal as the queen she will one day be. She looks at me, then at the king. She is not as easily fooled. Unnerved, I edge closer to the gate, too close to Epona's shrine. The stone horse moans its lament, and I cringe. The king does not quite hear, but it seems some of his tales are true, for he cocks his head as if straining after a whisper. The princess shakes her reins, glances back at me, and rides through. I stare after her and cannot speak. The words tangle again, and worse now. In the middle of the night, I wake and hear another person's breathing. I speak a word, to see, and light pools in my hand. The unseen person gasps, and I sit up, brushing straw from my hair. The princess sits on a stool by the door. She holds the hem of her dress an inch above the floor, and her eyes follow the light in my hands. I know what you're trying to do, she says. It won't work. What am I trying to do? I ask, curious. I've ordered the shrine be removed. You won't have it as a witness any more. I say nothing, and her voice rises, warbling high and scared. I'm the princess now. I can have you executed. I will have you executed if you tell a living soul. A sweet, damp breeze drifts in with a grumble of thunder, and I think of the river bank which will be impassable mud tomorrow. What could I tell them? I say. I do not know what I was. Witch? Half-wit? Princess? The last makes her blanch. Princess, I repeat, tasting the word that used to be familiar. Was I ever so frightened as she is now? Princess no longer. Now you are a common goose girl. In the whites of her eyes, too bright in this light, I see that I am not the only one with split memories. The spell she worked to switch us has shattered her as well, though she at least can talk. But she is only a princess now. I remember being a princess when being was required more than acting. The red book is under my pillow. I want to touch its pages, reassure myself that it is still there. I gesture with the light in my hand. Why? Why change one for the other? I mean the knowledge, the witchery, the the red book and all that goes with it. But she looks to the light's glare on the walls, the trickle of water under the shutters, the dirty straw of my palate. Why? She laughs. Look at it. I'd give it all up again. I'd lie beneath a thousand men to escape this. I pause, thinking to tell her of the gossip in the servant's hall. Conrad at least is honest. If a maid beds him, he will find her a station in the castle. The prince is known for sending his bedmates away, or worse. Such things were not mentioned in the betrothal agreement, but they are discussed freely here. But she is a princess, and she will wed him. Perhaps it will be different. She mistakes my hesitation. You can't have him, she says. He doesn't want you. I don't want him, I agree. What I want is a clear head and uncluttered memories, There's only one road to that. 
only one ending to the story we have woven. The impostor's cruel death, the princess's return, the wedding. How high is the price for a mind made whole? The princess rises, gathering her skirts. I will have you killed, she says. Remember that, princess. I start at the word. She turns scarlet, covers her mouth, and flees. Her footsteps fade into the patter of rain outside. And I am left with my light and my split mind. The rain is heavy and cold. And even though I run the short distance to the swineherd's hut, my dress is sodden and clinging to me by the time I reach it. I close the door behind me, and my eyes slowly take in the emptiness of the hut. He is not here. Of course, he is in the castle trying to be a king. And even if he were here, I decide, I would not tell him. This is my story, not his. And any other reason I came here is now not worth considering. I cannot remember if I have lain with a man. The princess certainly not. The witch certainly. But what I seek tonight is more than the comfort of skin on skin. Still, the rain comes down hard, and I pluck at my dress, unwilling to go back out. Though the swineherd must perforce stay away from this hut most nights, the hearth is swept clean, and before it he has set up a little shrine of lairs, household gods. Epona is there, and Mokus of swineherds and kings both, and the Lugovs. I sit before them, dripping onto the hard earth, and I tell them all. Though Epona could not help me, if returning my name to me was not help, I can still ask, still confide in the old gods. My hair is drying when I have finished my tale, though my face is wet. But the hearth remains cold, and my prayers are flat, and the rain does not abate. I have erred. I do not realize how badly I have erred until a footman shows me to a room too opulent for my tattered skirts. He leaves, and a figure rises from the chair by the window. Princess. He calls me. Perhaps in my confusion I did not see him in the shadows of the hut. Perhaps it was empty and he came later to listen at the chimney. Perhaps even Mokus the patron of kings and swineherds, decided to send my prayers to the man who follows both his paths. This last, I think, is most likely. The lairs, when they answer prayers, do so smiling. The crown's gleam does little to offset the lines it forces in his brow. The velvet robes drain his hair of color and reduce iron gray to silver gray. He greets me, royalty, to royalty, and laments my state, and promises to return me to my former position. And yet his face says other things, things a swineherd would say without hesitation, but a king may not. I nod, but do not answer him. I have not spoken since arriving. Instead, I watch the fall of light over his shoulders, and think of things broken. The Red Book, tucked into my bodice, presses heavy over my heart, and my skin smells of mud and last night's rain. I cannot let my son marry an impostor, he says. How high is the price for a mind made whole? I cannot pay with another's life. I have only myself for coin. If you were to do this, I say at last, if you were to expose her crime and elevate me to her place, then I would be the impostor. He tilts his head to the side, the same way he did when the stone horses spoke. I am no princess. I was and am not. My feet grow heavier, as if sinking through the floor, and one by one the memories of my mother the queen fade till they are like pictures carved in dust. 
And surely it is dust that makes my eyes water now to mourn the loss of a woman I never knew. Still, I speak, swallowing back salt tears. I am a witch woman, and I will not give that up for any cause. The Red Book burns against my chest and is gone. I cry out and put my hand to where it was and feel it again. Its words my blood now, its pages my flesh. It writes itself in me as the story is unwritten and unraveling. The king steps forward to catch me, afraid perhaps that a princess might faint. I let him take me by the shoulders. You too have a choice, I say, and look up at him. If you trust me, you have a choice. The prince's wedding day is a week past, but already the servants are replacing the banners with swaths of black cloth. The king, too weak to leave his bed, blesses the prince and princess and charges them with the care of the kingdom. I stand outside the gates, the air thick with my magic, and speak one word. To cleave. The king's eyes close at last, and the prince rises from his bedside, impatient to begin ruling. The princess lingers a moment, staring down at the body as if she might see some trace of magic on it. But she is a princess, now a queen, who has what she always wanted, and cannot read the marks of witchery. Beside me, the swineherd shudders and lets out a long breath. He rises, feeling how his body moves, how it differs from what was. I speak the second word, to cleave, and I take his hand. We walk out of the city, our fortune before us. After the story, the feedback. A lot of people liked episode number two, For Fear of Dragons, by Carrie Vaughn. Life Lemon said, This story brought up some important questions in my mind. I found it interesting how, in order to keep the peace, the priests had to unite the nation against some evil being. Some commenters tried to pin down just who or what the dragon in the story represented and had some fun chewing over the ending. Yossarian's grandson pointed out parallels to Joan of Arc. It's about a girl who feels she has a mission to destroy a dragon and save her country, he began, and ultimately concluded, it all seems like too much of a coincidence. But the compliments were not unanimous. Jelly said, The characters were 2D cardboard cutouts from central casting, including the protagonist. The exception to this trend, and the bright point of the story, was the dragon itself, and several others agreed. It's been really fun seeing the discussion develop. You can join in yourself by visiting forum.escapeartists.info and add your two cents about For Fear of Dragons or any of the other episodes. Podcastle is a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and is distributed on a Creative Commons attribution non-commercial license. Share it, but don't change it or sell it. Our theme music is by permission of Shiva in Exile. You can find them at magnatune.com. You can discuss this episode of PodCastle, or nearly anything else, in our forums. Just visit forum.escapeartists.info. And if you enjoyed this episode, tell a friend, or post to your blog about it, or consider donating via the PayPal link on our site. Philosopher John Austin said, Words are not, except in their own little corner, facts or things. We need, therefore, to prize them off the world, to hold them apart from and against it, so that we can realize their inadequacies and arbitrariness and can re-look at the world without blinkers.